Thank you very much, Andrea, for the invitation and to create uh, this uh, opportunity uh, to meet with uh, terrific uh, colleagues from all over the world, despite Italy is a little bit uh, in majority. And uh, so my title is Playing for Real, the Avatar and the Double in Analytical Psychodrama. Uh, but uh, finally, I will uh, talk about more generally about uh, double in psychoanalysis and above all uh, in Freudian work. So thank you very much, Mel, uh, to prepare the, the ground for my, for my talk. But we, we, we go one step uh, back because uh, after the enlightenment of technology, we will... Uh, uh, maybe investigate uh, uh, the unconscious and uh, obscure reasons of the creation of uh, avatars and doubles. So, uh, to begin, uh, the theme of the double has always been effective in psychoanalysis, uh, and this for several, uh, several reasons. I, I will review some of them in this talk uh, without uh, any pretension of being uh, exhaustive. First of all, psychoanalysis seems to be familiar to the, this topic mainly because at its core, in the theorization of a subject split from the outset, traversed in all actions carried out, even the most rational of his or her doing, by his or her unconscious double. The whole history of psychoanalysis may well then be considered as a technique for establishing a dialogue with this double to exorcise it by giving it a voice. Secondly, and more precisely, for psychoanalysis uh, epistemology, the development of the subject is based on the constitution of an intrapsychic uh, double. I refer both uh, to the narcissistic processes that underline the inner image of the, of the self uh, and to the processes of symbolization that allow the institution of the sense of a continuity of the word and of beings. As Cesare and Sara Botella recall in their insightful book on psycholo uh, psychological figurability, that I quote, the double is likely to arise in the face of fear of psychological death, in the face of the risk of non-representation coupled with the, a lack of perception. Thirdly, and on the more clinical level, although not unrelated to Freudian uh, metapsychology, the double haunts psychoanalysis uh, in its practice. Through transference and counter-transference movements, people in therapy are constantly led to create doubles and avatars, both in the analytical uh, relationship and in their everyday life. Beside this general trend, specific essays have been dedicated to, to this topic. Obviously, the most emblematic and complex case is re represented by Freud's essay, The Uncanny, Das Unheimliche, uh, published in 1919. Widely inspired by Otto Rank's article, The Double, published in its first first version in 1914. The Uncanny published the same, years, uh, same year of the crucial Freudian essay Beyond the Pleasure Principle, opens with a strange statement. I prepared a PowerPoint with the uh, Freudian quotation uh, uh, to allow you uh, to follow despite my barbarian accent. So the, um, the uncanny opens with a strange statement. It is only rarely that a psychoanalyst feels impelled to investigate the subject of aesthetics, even when aesthetics is understood to mean not merely the theory of beauty, um, but the theory of the qualities of feeling. He works in other strata of mental life and has little to do with the subdued emotional impulses which inhibited in their aims and dependent on 
host of concurrent factors usually furnish the material for the study of aesthetics. A strange statement for a psychoanalyst who makes use of literary quotations, pictorial and theatri theatrical metaphors abundantly. And let us not forget that the basis of psychoanalysis theory is named after a tragic hero, Oedipus. These statements seem to comprise uh, some Socratic irony, especially since Freud continues uh, by saying, okay. but it does occasionally happen that uh, he, the psychoanalyst, has to interest himself in some particular province of that subject, uh, aesthetics. And this province usually proves to be a rather remote one, and one which has been neglected in the specialist literature of aesthetics. The subject of the uncanny is a province of this kind. Among the topics ignored by aesthetics research and which, on the contrary, interest psychoanalysis, Freud gives an important place to the Neimliche. The uncanny, il perturbante, we know that uh, we, we had uh, many, many problems to, to translate this uh, term, or in French, l'inquietante étrangeté, ou mieux peut-être l'inquietante familier, uh, as uh, Jacques Derrida preferred to translate. A concept that Freud links to what triggers fears and anxiety. I quote to better explain what the meaning of the word unheimlich mean for Freud. The German word unheimlich is obviously the, op the opposite of heimlich, homely, heimisch, nat native, the opposite of what is familiar. And we are tempted to conclude that what is uncanny is frightening precisely because it is not known and familiar. Naturally, not everything that is new and unfamiliar is frightening, however. However, Freud, with an impressively long lexical note, travels across the whole spectrum of the different meanings of the word Heimlich. To shift in its meaning from familiar to that of hidden, obscure, inaccessible, in relation to knowledge, hidden so dangerous. The familiar becomes the hostile. And he concludes, thus, Heimlich is a word the meaning of which develops uh, in the direction of ambivalence, until it finally coincides with its opposite, unheimlich. Unheimlich is some way or other a subspecies of heimlich. The word unheimlich therefore, therefore seems to already carry in its structure the ambivalence of the sentiment it designates. The uncanny feeling, in fact, seems to occur especially when there are doubts whether an apparently animate being is really alive, so the avatar, for instance, or conversely, whether a lifeless object might not be, in fact, animate. And he refers in this connection to the impression made by Wok's work figures ingeniously constructed dolls and automata. And he refers, of course, uh, of, um, to Hoffman, um, um, Sanderman. But this analysis is even more appropriate to our topic if we consider the rest of the examples Freud summons. This is one. These themes are all concerned with the phenomenon of the double, doppelganger or uh, sosie in French, which appears in every shape and in every degree of the de development. Thus, we have characters who are to be considered identical because they look alike. alike. 
This relation is accentuated by mental processes leaping from one of these characters to another, by what we should call telepathy. So the one possesses knowledge, feelings and experience in common with the other. Or it is marked by the fact that the subject identifies himself with someone else so that he is in doubt as to which his self is or substitutes the extraneous self for his own. In other words, there is a doubling, dividing and interchanging of the self. And finally, there is a, the constant recurrence of the same thing, the repetition of the same features. Uh, here Freud uh, quotes Nietzsche, Nietzsche uh, or character traits uh, or vicissitudes of the same crimes or even the same names through several consecutive generations. In a footnote, uh, Freud also tells of an autobiographical experience of the uncanny in relation to the theme of the double. I was sitting alone in my wagon lit compartment when a more than usually violent jolt of the train swung back the door of the adjoining washing cabinet and an elderly gentleman in a dressing gown and a traveling cap came in. I assumed that in leaving the washing cabinet, which lay between the two compartments, he had taken the wrong di direction and come into my compartment by mistake. Jumping up with the intention of putting him right, I at once realized that my dismay that the intruder was nothing but my own reflection in the looking glass of the open door. I can still recollect that I truly disliked his appearance. Instead, therefore, of being frightened, frightened by our doubles, I simply failed to recognize them as such. It is not possible, though, that our dislike of them was a vestigial trace of the archaic reaction which feels the double to be something uncanny. The double is one of the artistic literary themes that best evoke the disturbing effect. In fact, Freud observe, observes, summarizing uh, uh, Otto Rank's analysis, that the double represents originally an expedient to prevent the disappearance of the ego, a phantasmatic remedy against the fear of death. And then he adds, and probably the immortal soul was the first double of our body. Here then is the soul, which the body would be a pale image, ending up precisely to being a copy, a mortal simulacrum created only for human need. The double, originally connoted as a posit positive entity, then takes on the exact opposite value to become an uncanny element. This is not the first time that psychoanalysis notices a similar movement. In this essay, essay on the uncanny, Freud relates the ambivalence of the, figures of, uh, the figure of the double to the process of formation of the divine. I could. Uh, okay, the quality of uncanniness can only be um, can only uh, come from the fact of the double being a creation dating back to a very early mental stage, long since surmounted a stage incidentally at which it wore a more friendly aspect. The double has become a thing of terror just as, after the collapse of their religion, the gods turned into demons. In 1923, a study dedicated to a 17th century demonolo demonological neurosis, Freud uh, returned in his subject to clarify it further. 
Concerning the evil demon, we know that he is regarded as the antithesis of God and yet is very close to him in his nature. The evil demon of the Christian faith, the devil of the Middle Ages, was, according to Christian mythology, himself a fallen angel and uh, of a godlike nature. It does not need much analytic perspicacity to guess that God and devil were originally identical. Were a single figures, figure which was later split into two figures with op opposite attributes. In the early ages of religion, God himself still possessed all the terrifying features which were afterwards combined for, uh, to form a counterpart of him. This um, ambivalent value of representation exemplified here by Freud in the process of forming religious mythology belongs to the same logic that is at work in dreams and, as Freud taught us, also in ancient languages, the coexistence of opposites. These experiences, the dream, the evolution of religions, the study of archaic languages, all seem to testify not only to the original coexistence of opposites, but also to the ever imminent possibility that they may reverse into one another. Those who have learned to listen to the language of dreams know that the unconscious is alien to the principle of contradiction. So I come to the, my second part uh, where I um, analyze a specific setting uh, of the uh, psychoanalytical work, the psychodrama. Our hypothesis is that psychoanalysis, or perhaps uh, something in psychoanalysis, aims to take up this archaic meaning embedded in mimesis, what metaphysic has, which, sorry, metaphysic has generally set aside in the search for truth. We all know that Plato was the first to understand mimesis in the reproductive sense of imitation. It is particular in Rep Republic that he establishes the meaning of mimesis according to the meaning of a passive and faithful copy, with negative connotation with respect to the search of truth. On the contrary, um, the archaic post-Homeric text made of mimesis ritual activities such as dance, singing, and music. Therefore, expressive activities and not merely imit imitative. But let's have a look at Plato's famous condemnation. I quote uh, some uh, uh, excerpt from Republic uh, uh, Book 10. Then the imitator is a long way off the truth and can do all things because he lightly touches on a small part of them and that part an image. Image is in Greek phantasma here. If he is a good artist, he may deceive children and simple persons. The imitator is a wizard and, or an actor who makes us believe to know everything when he is ignorant and a charlatan. The analogies between the accusation made to the imitator by Plato and those often made to the psychoanalyst are striking. The dimension of illusion or suggestion, the fact of dealing with weak or irrational subject of touching everything, charlatanism, precisely what does not make of their technique a science, of being a wizard, Lévi-Strauss, Claude Lévi-Strauss uh, uh, wrote an essential article or this, on this uh, topic and relationship. The fact of being interested in phantasma, fantasy, rather than in icons, scientific and technical images. 
But what is Phantasma? For Plato, Plato defines it as an image appearance, an image ba made by imitation and which is only an image of image. To say it in the words of Plato sophist, that bring us even closer to psychoanalysis, uh, Phantasma is, a, and I quote Plato, a human dream made for the use of the awake. For, psycho, for psychoanalysis, uh, phantasma, uh, in English fantasy, but I, I prefer to use the, the French translation, uh, phantasme, that uh, brings together uh, the ghost and the fantasy, refers to imagination, but less in the philosophical sense of the term than in that of uh, an imaginary word animated by a creative activity. Freud inaugurated his theory of the effectiveness of fantasy phantasma in 1897, the year he began to have doubts about the truly traumatic nature of the story uh, of his neurotica. Fantasy reshape our stories and memories on the basis of unconscious and more or less archaic desires. I would like here to deal in particular with a, psycho uh, a psychoanalytical device that has privileged connection with the notion of mimesis, imitation, expression, and with the, rule, um, the role that mimetic practice plays in recovery of phantasma, ghost and fantasies at the same time. I will refer to individual analytical psychodrama and the experience I have had of it as a co-therapist in my practice in a day hospital. Just a few words to remind or explain the specificity of this therapeutic framework. Analytical psychodrama has been inspired by Moreno's theater of spontaneity to apply it to the principles of psychoanalysis. In France, this practice has been taken up and developed by um, Serge Lebovici, who adapted it to work with children in, uh, at Necker uh, Hospital. Unlike Moreno's uh, psychodrama, the setting, the stage, is extremely plain. Just uh, some uh, chairs uh, um, to, 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 to let uh, the participant uh, a seat. All the interest is focused on the verbalization of the inner psychic world. This technique is particularly appropriate for children and teenagers but also for those patients who present important symbolization problems and non-neurotic defenses, splitting, splitting process, disavowal, projection. The individual analytical psychodrama takes place in the following way. In a single, single play, there are two to six actor therapists seated and play a play manager who does not play invites the pa patient over from the waiting room. They quickly discuss about current events, thoughts and, or feelings and then elaborate a scenario together. In the meanwhile, co-therapist remains silent almost in a fantasy dimen dimension. Then the patient casts the actors and him or herself in various roles. During the scene, the play manager may decide to create other characters and launch them on the stage. Everything can be played, relatives and friends of the patient's past and present life, deceit people, objects, feelings, dreams. I will take into consideration two cases that reveal very different modalities of identific identification in psychodrama and show how this process can produce different types of doubles. 
The first case uh, is uh, under study is Tom. Of course, I changed the name. A, sh a shy and introverted 23-year-old man who nevertheless uh, has very conflictual relationships with others. He comes to, psych to psychodrama precisely to deal with these conflicts. He regularly proposes to stage certain conflicts between his parents, his father in particular, and his grandparents. The father is rep represented in all the scene and Tom proposes systematically to take up his role. It's very strange because normally the patient mm, wants to play his own role, at least in the first scene. So it's quite, um, quite strange. Um, the expression taking up the role, however, it is not correct because each time we have the impression that it is rather the patient who is cannibalized by the fa father figure. Indeed, Tom doesn't show any empathy toward his own character, played by a co-therapist, and the severe paternal injunctions make him disappear entirely. When he acts as his father, the patient changes radically. From a shy and inhibited, inhibited boy, he transforms himself into a kind of domestic tyrant, taking the whole family hostage with a system of rigid and partially inintelligible rules. He plays his father standing against everyone, whether they are family members or third par parties. Once we try to play an explanation between the grandparents and the father, the patient go got very angry and started repeating mecha mechanically, I made an effort once, but I won't a second time. Je fais l'effort une fois, mais je le ferai pas deux. The co-therapist playing the mother tried to seize the opportunity of this statement to remind that in a family, efforts are to be made and repeated every time. But the patient did not want to hear and immures himself in this kind of mantra. I made an effort, an effort once, but I will not a second time. The denial, denial of the possibility of a second time is puzzling. What does it mean for the patient this total adherence to only once? What can't happen a second time? The phenomenon of identification with the father is extremely intense in this young man. This seems to be a narcissistic identifica identification where only the super egotic qualities are incorporated and not interjected, thus overwhelming the patient's psychological autonomy. As Nicola Abraham and Maria Toroc recall in their important work, The Shell and the Kernel, interjection corresponds to a pro process while incorporation corresponds to a fantasy. The function of fantasy is to avoid the introduction of reality and to prevent the modification of the self, which is why all fantasy has strictly narcissistic purpose. In Tom's case, the father seems to have been incorporated. When Tom plays, there is nothing left of his own identity. There has been no metaphorization, symbolization, elaboration of the uh, uh, father figure. The father's ideal has cannibalized the patient. According to Abram and Torok, all the phantasmatization resulting from incorporation seeks to heal in the imagination a wound that has actually occurred and affected the ideal object. The psychodramatic work with this patient aims to make him accept through the transferential space of the game, the loss of this wounded ideal object and the possibility of recovering it. Uh, three minutes? <laughs> 
it's okay. Um, through symbolization and metaphorization work, through languages and transference. I just have a, a, a last case, but it's really very short, uh, because it's interesting because it's a totally different uh, uh, process of identification. The case of Rebecca highlights very different modalities of identification. Rebecca is a young woman who has admitted into the day hospital several, several years ago. She has a very conflictual relationship with her family. She has not seen her father for over 10 years. She has various disorders or, and phobias, especially about contamination. Her discourses are characterized by the manifestation of a generalized hatred toward all her relatives. Therapists have diffic difficulties uh, distinguishing between different people, time, and action in her discourses. She always represents herself, herself as a victim of physical or psychological violence by other family members and friends. As a, uh, she represents herself as a champion of justice, often ev evoking political causes for which she fights on her own against her family and friends. In Rebecca's case, uh, the other is without exception a persecutor. The only identif identification that Rebecca seems to be able to establish is what Melanie Klein called projective identification. Projective identification is an unconscious fantasy in which aspects of the self or an, an internal object are split off and attributed to an external object. Fantasies of projective identification identification are sometimes considered uh, to have acquisitive as well as attributive properties, meaning that the fantasy involves not only disposing of aspects of one's own psyche, but also of entering the mind of the other in order to acquire desired aspect of his or her psyche. In this case, projective and introjective fantasies operate together. The uh, introjection process uh, can be perceived, nevertheless, uh, as a violent intrusion from outside. When Rebecca plays the role of the persecutors, she has much difficulty in appearing spontaneous and credible. It is hard for her to change her point of view. During a session when she was supposed to play the role of, of a friend who betrayed her, Rebecca tried to justify the argument for, from uh, her friend's point of view and says it's an interpretation. On this word, the play manager interrupted the scene, the scene and asked her to explore this point further. At the core of the notion of interpretation lies, of course, the possibility of different and simultaneous points of view. But Rebecca, uh, Rebecca uh, re uh, reacted by saying that it was ironical and that she used this expression as her boss did when confronted to accusation of harassment. Other people's point of view continues to be inaccessible to Rebecca, and they are always deemed persecutory. Rebecca has the feeling to have her own identity and to exist as a person only by projecting aggressive and bad parts of her onto the others. I really finished. As you know, psychoanalysis prefers to speak about identification than, rather than identity, because the self is supposed to be a dynamic and moving entity, resulting from several processes of identif identification, a complex and never finished exchange of introjection and projection. If psychoanalysis is somewhere close to the sophistic, uh, crit uh, sophist criticized by Plato, it is precisely because of his willingness to try, through dialogue, to catch the fantasy, le fantasme, the unconscious desire, beyond 
beyond the icons, the conscious and adequate speech. Together with the patient, he tries to distinguish and put into words the play of spectra and fantasies in what we do not resign ourselves to call our identity. Thank you very much. <laughs>